everyone, and uh, welcome to Toronto Apologetics. Really excited to have you guys along, and uh, we welcome you uh, to this uh, live stream. Uh, those of you who are watching uh, uh, Jihad Watch, uh, Robert Spencer's uh, YouTube channel, will know that uh, David Wood was uh, was just on there, and uh, he just hopped from there onto uh, my channel, which I'm very thankful for. And so looking for, forward to a wonderful session tonight. Uh, Toronto Apologetics is a ministry dedicated to the defense of the Christian faith. Uh, we encourage you to uh, subscribe to the channel and also to like and, and to share. Uh, and so without any further ado, I want to bring on the one and only David Wood, the Dizzle. David, how you doing, buddy? I'm all right. It's good to see you. I know you were on with... Uh, with Robert Spencer uh, talking about uh, jihad. And of course, that is uh, one of Robert's, uh, that's his main specialty. Yep. One yeah. of the best, one of the best ever. Indeed, indeed. And so I just want to welcome you, David. Thank you for taking the time uh, to to be with us tonight. And uh, it's always an honor to have you, David. And and we, we sure go back uh, quite a while, um, way back into the days of Nabil Qureshi. Yeah, that's uh, way back in the day. Where'd we meet? Um, we met for the first time in um, in Dearborn, yeah, in, in Michigan. Uh, that that memorable year in which you and, and Nabil were arrested. My home away from home. Yeah, and uh, with a couple of others. Uh, I think it was Dearborn. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dearborn, Michigan. Yeah, I haven't heard a lot. Of, I haven't heard a lot about Dearborn in a while. Yeah, the only thing I heard, David, on Dearborn is the Muslims there were. Uh, really freaking out over the whole uh, LGBTQ being taught in the schools, mm. transgenderism, and they just, they really raised up a stink. But as you know, the mainstream media will not report on that. Um, if, if it was Christians, they would be talking about uh, homegrown terrorists that the FBI would have to investigate. Uh, but because they were Muslims uh, protesting against all this curriculum, uh, they didn't really say much. You, you just You just said a boat. <laughs> oh, I can't help. That's my that's my Canadian my Canadian nature coming out of me there, David. Hey, uh, we, uh, we we uh, we we we've all talked about this before, but um, uh, years ago we we're doing a uh, we we're doing a show um, uh, at, on the on the Trinity Channel, and a, a yeah. jihad a jihadi called in and said, uh, "So you guys are talking about Muhammad, eh?" <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then he, he said he was going to kill us all and stuff like that. No. Uh, yeah, to, that's a clear giveaway, David. You know yeah. that the A at the end of a sentence is, is a clear giveaway that you're dealing with a bona fide Canuck, a bona yeah. fide Canadian. So, hey, uh, is, is it true like you guys are obsessed with Tim Hortons? Is that a real thing or is that a myth? Yeah, it's no, it's true. Uh, Tim Hortons is the national coffee of Canada, it, it even outstrips Starbucks. Wow. Yeah. So I know that there's some Tim Hortons in the United States. Um, whenever I go to the Buffalo airport in New York, uh, they, they always have Tim Hortons. I guess that's for all the Canadians coming over for, for the shopping sprees. But uh, yeah, Tim Hortons, that is, yeah, that is the nectar of the Canadians. Yeah. yeah. So how you been doing, David? Overall, how are you? How's, how's, how's everything? Uh, I mean, I could lie and say great, but uh, no constantly busy so yeah i mean take today my wife wakes me up because we gotta we gotta take uh yeah. our son paley for a, a bone density test and so on and then my son luke was i we usually make luke carry carry uh paley because luke's uh he's 250 pounds of muscle so yeah he, he's good at carrying stuff and uh luke wasn't around so um so yeah we i loaded Paley onto his uh, wheelchair and we went in and, and interestingly they had this um they had this interesting crane device to actually uh, yes. pick him up but in my mind it's like hey by the time you get this thing around him to where you can lift him I could have lifted him um yeah. anyway then I'm so I'm sitting there in the room while they're doing this editing my video I get back uh share the video immediately record another video and then before I could edit that one that was onto the live stream with uh Robert and then as soon as that one's done over here to you so uh wow. i mean it's it's a lot of stuff i i mean i do a, i'm still doing a lot of stuff that i that i like doing and so on mm -hmm. it's just uh it's just uh like like uh endless yeah i hear you brother 
I hear you. Which when I was when I was younger, I mean, you know, I could keep this up. I could keep this up forever. Yeah. And now that I get the, the the older I get, now it's like, uh, this yeah, is cru- this is crushing me. I don't think I'm going to survive to to fifty. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a crazy number of weeks for me as well. Just a lot going on with work. And I don't know what it is, David. There's been a death spree. And you know, I have a very large family, so we just had a lot of people dying. And it's just been crazy. So, um, yeah, I guess the aging process really, it begins to add up. And we begin to realize that we're not as young as we used to be. We're not those spring chickens anymore. Yeah, and it's uh, it's weird because I don't know. what It's like built into my family culture. Yeah. Like you're supposed to just burn out, right? You're not supposed to like be thinking, hey, <laughs> I need to be around for my grandkids and stuff like that. So like, yeah. nope, just 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 work yourself to death and burn out. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I hear you, brother. So David, tonight, I the reason why I brought you on is I just want to talk about the collapse of Islam. And I also wanted to let our viewers know that if you have any questions uh, for David or myself or both of us, uh, please put a Q, uh, capital Q, in the uh, chat, and then we will get your questions. Uh, I don't want to hold Dave too long because uh, he's a busy man and uh, he's been on the go nonstop. So, so David, just thinking about the collapse of Islam, I've just been noticing that uh, a, a lot of Muslims are coming to Christ. Uh, I hear a lot of news coming out of Iran, many uh, Shias uh, turning to Christ, and uh, uh, even here in the West, in the Western world, um, why do you think maybe the the what do you think maybe one of the contributing factors to the the collapse as we see of Islam the decline of Islam what do you think maybe one of those contributing factors uh I can't give you one but I can give you a bunch okay sure <laughs> well I mean it, it, you you've been you've been doing this for a long time right like like I remember years ago I'm talking like 2000s I mean you're doing this like and like you were already established doing this in like 2007 2008 by that time right by the time that yeah yes yeah. yeah. so i started my debates with Chibir ali back in 90 uh 92 mm-hmm. 92 and then yeah and then just kept m- mushrooming from there so that is really really old school yeah but i mean I, i'm sure you can remember if you go back to like 2005 2006 2007 it was compared to now very rare to hear yeah. Uh, an ex-Muslim who w- would acknowledge that he's an ex-Muslim, who's public about mm-hmm. being um, an ex-Muslim. It, it was it was so much like that that when me and Nabil back in the day were starting off thinking about what we were going to focus on, we were thinking that we might be much more effective uh, insulating people from converting to Islam than you know, trying to show Muslims that they need to leave Islam because it seemed it seemed so different. I mean, th- th- I mean, I just spent four years talking to one guy, right? right? Four years. And so you're sitting there doing the math in your head. Wait a minute. If it takes like four. And by the way, that was quick. I don't know what the statistic is now, but back then the statistic was for Muslims who convert to Christianity on average, it was seven years from the time that the gospel is shared with them to until they convert. The average was seven years. So four right. years seemed like a long time, but it was actually fast compared to the average. So it was to the point where, I mean, do we re- really want to focus on um, on winning Muslims to Christ when it takes it takes so long? Um, and then it it all just uh, it it all just shifted. And there's, there's there's multiple factors. I mean, one of them is that you know back in the day, you the world was was pretty segregated religiously. Right. You had Muslims right. over there, you had Muslims over there, you had Christians over here, you had Hindus over there. Uh, but then you started getting immigration where now, now you didn't need to go over to Saudi Arabia and possibly, you know, get murdered for preaching the gospel. Now you can walk down the street and run into, run into Muslims. And so, Mm -hmm. I mean, Muslims were, uh, you had, you had people who were immigrating, but you also had Muslims who were coming over for school and so on. And, you know, for the first time in their lives, a, a Muslim student was away from home. And for the first time in his life, he's got some Christian friends now from class and so on. And, uh, so that, that, uh, really helped get a lot of things started. Um, and so you had you had people over there, but then all of a sudden you also get the internet. Yeah. To where now that. even Muslims who are in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and Iran, you now have access to them, uh, especially now when you have you have open access to Muslims in Muslim countries with a thing you carry around in your pocket. Yeah. I mean, you can you can sit there talking to Muslims on Facebook 
with something that you carry around in your pocket. And so there's that. And then in addition to that, all of a sudden, after 14 centuries, we have open access to their sources. And that is a, that was a huge shift because, um, you know, in, in like the in like the 60s and 70s here in the U.S., I don't know what it was like in, in Canada, but here in the U.S., uh, you know, you had people like uh, so you have people like Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali and so on. They start mm -hmm. off and they're the nation of Islam, but then they, they become more orthodox and so on. But uh, they're the people who are preaching. Um, the Muslim leaders who are preaching will say pretty much anything to their right. audience to convince them to convert. So with the African-American community um, in America, it was, hey, you know, look what Christians did. Muhammad, he freed the slaves and proclaimed everyone equal. That's total nonsense. Yeah. But total. if you don't, if you don't have Sahih al Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and Sunan Abu Dawud, which they didn't, then the the preachers get get to say whatever they want, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Right. And so you know they 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 did this with the African American community. They they would do this with women. Uh, hey, Muhammad was a champion of women's rights, and right. you know he gave women unparalleled rights that women never had in Christianity. And so there's that. And then there's, of course, the, the science and oh, the Quran, that's the fount of scientific wisdom and knowledge and so yeah. on. So they're saying all this stuff and no one is in a position to raise your hand and say that's not true because no one has their sources. No one knows anything about it. And uh, then all of a sudden we get open access to their sources and we get to start we get to start exposing those lies. And uh, and so it's a situation where, I mean, Islamic apologetics. Um, even for people who aren't really interested in apologetics, just the things they hear all their lives. You're, you're, if you're a Muslim and you just go with what you hear from your parents and your imams your entire life and from Zakir Naik, you think it's like, it, it's indisputable, right? I mean, yeah, this is clearly, yeah. I mean, how could all these scientific miracles in this book be perfectly preserved and the greatest man ever? And it's all total nonsense. And so they really mess themselves. And you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a, it reminds me of um, Alexander the Great when yeah. the, the, the Greeks the Greeks were scared of the Persians. They were scared of the Persian Empire. Yeah. The Greeks, when the Persians invaded, the Greeks could unite and they could eventually, uh, you know, repel the the Persians. But they weren't going to go over there and mess with the Persians. They were terrified of act actually going over there. And then people started showing up uh, to Greece, going, you know, these Persians. You know, we, we've been traveling. We went by, and their cities are—you know—their walls are, are falling apart, and their soldiers are sitting around drunk. If you had a very well-trained, well-disciplined, small, even small army, you could just go over there and crush these guys. Right. And Ale Alexander the Great said, "Okay, I'll do it," and did it. He just—I mean—he he, he sliced right through them like yeah. like it was a joke. But the, the, so what, what I'm thinking is like psychologically, it was. The Persians are this powerful empire that keeps invading. Not no Persia's actually really, really weak right now, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what Islam is like, right? It's been it's been propped up on nothing but lies, and all their their, their speakers and their leaders and their apologists have propped up people's confidence um, on nothing but lies, and they got away with it because people were in no position to expose those lies until right now. And it's just so easy. We've got the internet, we've got all their sources, yeah. and we can just go through wreaking havoc on everything Ahmed Didat and Zakir Naik have, have ever said. And right. uh the, the, you know, the, the, the only the only real concern for, for Christians right now should be like lots of lots of people are becoming atheists as well. Mm -hmm. Um now 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 my view is um if a Muslim in Saudi Arabia is leaving Islam, I think that's good no matter no matter what, because, you know, I'm looking forward to a day where they have enough diversity where they're not they're not crushing people because of because of what they believe. So um, so when I hear that, when I hear that that Muslims in you know Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and so on have even become atheists, I think right. that that that's positive for for the future uh, of that country. Um, but, you know, fr from a from a Christian perspective where we want to share the gospel with people um, that, you know, you, we have to be like it's it's all positive. It's all it, it's, it's all positive. The only concern would be, hey, we, we also need to be making sure that we uh, share some evidence for right. the existence of God and so on. But uh, sure. I mean, it's, it's it's awesome. I mean, you know, it, it's easy to look. Around. I always tell people this. It's easy to look around the world and you know, ISIS and all that stuff and the Taliban, it's easy to look around and, 
and get discouraged. I mean, the, the rape gangs and politicians and the media constantly defending this, this ideology that, that causes all of this um, carnage and rape and everything else. And it's easy to get discouraged. But I mean, if you want to reach Muslims with the gospel, there is you do not want to be in any other time in history. This is the greatest yeah. time in history. I yeah. mean, we actually, we, we are the generation that gets to watch this fall apart and we get to, we get to go in there and preach the gospel. It's like, it's just like an awesome time. It's an exciting time to be alive, David. And as I don't know if you know this, but Toronto is the uh, multicultural, one of the multicultural centers of the world. There's uh, almost every person from the globe, uh, lives here in Toronto. There's patches all over the city and in the greater Toronto area of Sikhs and Hindus, and you've got uh, Muslims and so forth. And so God has brought a huge mission field to our doorstep. And uh, while we still support missions, obviously, God has brought this huge mission field to our doors. And I remember when I first started debating Muslims in the early 90s, David, it's interesting that one of the things that, that I pressed on was the so-called myth of the preservation of the Quran. And so all I had to go by is uh, various uh, scholarship, you know, scholars like Arthur, uh, Arthur Jeffrey and many others, uh, current scholars that were calling attention to the fact that within the Islamic sources in the Hadith and the Sirah, there were indications there that the Quran was incomplete, it had missing verses and so forth and so on. And of course, at the time when I was debating apologists like Shabir Ali, um, they knew that as well, but the people, the common folks, they simply took by by fiat, by fiat whatever the imams were saying and you're absolutely correct there was really no way to ch to 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 check what i was saying unless you went to a library looked up the sirah or the hadith and so forth uh, in those days we had to photocopy things xerox things uh you, when you're doing your research but i think with the advent of the internet you're absolutely right it has it has now virtually opened this door to knowledge that uh, our Muslim friends no longer can deny that the evidence that the Quran has not been perfectly preserved. And this was the, you know, this was the common mantra we kept hearing was, you know, unlike your Bibles, which have been corrupted by the Jews and the Christians, and you guys removed references to Muhammad, uh, our sources are immaculate. They've been preserved since the days of Muhammad. No difference, no, no jot, no tittle has been changed. Uh, and so now, um, you know, with Yasser Qadir, uh, Qadir uh, even admitting Yasser Qadi admitting that there are holes in the narrative of how the Quran was compiled. Um, he, he knows that we know, and he knows what academics know in this area. So I think that one of the reasons why Islam is collapsing is, I think, David, that Islam cannot, cannot uh, tolerate being criticized. And there's many warnings in the Quran not to, not to uh, question the Prophet or Allah. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not for a believer, man or woman, to question what Allah and his messenger have decided on any given matter. And so to critique the Quran, to critically analyze it uh, to the Muslim is, is a huge no-no. Um, so I think knowledge is power here. And I think that uh, as exactly like you said, David, I think the internet has just been uh, a, a great leap into the light for, for many Muslims who are beginning to check out what you say in your, in your live streams and so forth. So I, I totally agree that this knowledge, uh, this exposure of these Muslim myths, I think, are causing a lot of Muslims to uh, experience a crisis of faith. And and David, just to be straightforward with you, I've been dealing with uh, Muslims in in Muslim countries, particularly women who are in a very very vulnerable situation, and they have seen the abuses of the of various groups like the Taliban and and others, and and they have seen how ugly Islam is to the point that not only have they rejected it, but they've come to a saving faith in Christ. They look at Jesus and see how beautiful he is, how different he is. Um, so I think you're right. I think that uh, the internet has been a huge boom uh, for us and for our Muslim friends who are who are seeking to know the truth. And so you, you can check out Sahih al-Bukhari, you can check out Sahih Muslim, uh, uh, Ibn Majah, or, or whatever hadith you want to search, it's right there, it's available. And, uh, and so, that whole myth about Muhammad liberating the slaves and, and liberating women, uh, th that is just absolute, uh, that's mythology. Um, so I, I totally agree with you, David. It's actually made our jobs as apologists uh, much more easier. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, a couple, couple of things there. I mean, you, you talked about how uh, um, people, you know, 
people in Muslim countries are seeing what Islam actually is like, and they're they're rejecting it. Um, but you know, we point out that it, it, this avalanche of apostasy. We didn't come up with that. That that's a that's a Muslim complaint, right? It's their leaders running around in panic mode talking about this avalanche of apostasy, and uh, it, it was one of the Muslims who um, was complaining about this. Uh, estimated, I think he said he estimates that. Five percent of the population, even in Muslim countries, are closet atheists. They're scared to say uh, anything. And then uh, there was there was one Muslim, uh, not even a terribly um, popular Muslim, Asadullah Ali, who says that he personally has met hundreds of people who are pretending to be Muslims. And he's talking about um, people who've memorized the Quran, people who are in madrasas and so on, who are actually who don't believe it. They're just, you know, they're, they're scared of what their community will, uh, will say or, or do in response to them becoming unbelievers. So they continue pretending to be, um, believers. And so, yeah, all, all the way around the world. Um, but you know, you, you were talking about, um, the, the myth of the preservation of the Quran and it's, it's so, it's so shockingly ironic. Once you read the Muslim sources, it's so amazing that you go through the Muslim sources and the Muslim sources make it sound like a, a total disaster of trying to preserve the Quran. Like they did yeah. the best they they did the best they can, but entire chapters were because they, were, they they tried to rely for a while on memorization, and it was a disaster. Uh, entire chapters were lost. Uh, hundreds of verses were lost from one chapter because the people who had them memorized died in battle. And so it's it's a Muslim myth that you know that. You had hundreds of people in that first generation. They all had the Quran memorized. And so there's no way to the bull. It's, it's, it's nonsense, yeah. right? They tried memorizing it. The people went out into battle. A bunch of them died. And not according to me, according to Muslim sources, massive parts of the Quran were forever lost because the mm -hmm. only people who had them memorized died. And then you have issues like, you know, Aisha's sheep eating uh, verses of the Quran and so on. You have all these issues. And then the, the, uh, their apologists who know these things, who know what's in their sources, sure but they know their followers and non-Muslims don't. So they get, get to go around spreading this myth of, of perfect preservation, not one letter's difference anywhere in the entire, in the entire history of the Quran. Um, so they're going around saying that. And then what's amazing, what's even more amazing, their books, their sources, the, the Quran and the Hadith affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Right. Right. And yet they're going around saying, ah, the Bible's been corrupted when it's the exact opposite. And you're, you know, after you've read this, after you've read the sources, you look at this and wait, they're, they're saying their book's been preserved and our book has been corrupted when according to their sources, their book was repeatedly changed and yeah. ours and ours has been perfectly preserved. And, and they're, they're going around, they're going around spouting this, uh, it, going, uh, I mentioned earlier when, when me and Nabil were sort of getting started off and, uh, we were talking, what do we want to focus on? And he said, if you really want to, if you wanted to focus on, on one point, his view was pr focus on preservation of the Quran. Now I thought, I thought it was ridiculous. What are you talking about? You got jihad, you've got the, the messed up character of Muhammad. You've got all, you've got all these other issues because I'm not thinking in terms of perfect preservation being this super important point. Whereas for Nabil, um, that's something that really, really bothered him because you know, given, I, I have no experience of what it's like to be raised with this myth of perfect preservation and then to right. find out that it's false. Uh, whereas Nabil has experienced that. And so someone who's actually been through that, um, it's, you've been told all your life, my book is perfect. Not one letter's difference anywhere. And then, you know, you find out that it's a complete lie what what it actually does is it it flips a light switch on. Wait a minute, all these guys, the Sheikh Yasser Qadis of the world, they told me perfect preservation right down to the letter, and yet they knew it wasn't true. Yeah, they knew it wasn't true. And I have video clips of Sheikh Yasser Qadi when he's speaking to a popular audience, in other words, average people and yes. non-Muslims. He's telling them perfect preservation right down to the letter, not one letter's difference in the history of the Quran. That's what he's telling them. It's total nonsense. And he knew it was total nonsense. We know he knew it was total nonsense because we also have videos of him around the same time where he's talking to what he called students of knowledge. These are Muslims who are going to become scholars. And he knows they're going to 
they're going to find this stuff out. So he tells them that, yes, in different parts of the world, there are different Qurans and they have different words and different letters and so on. He's he's being honest with them. And then what happens is it starts spreading in the Muslim community that Yasser Qadi actually doesn't really believe in the perfect preservation of the Quran. Then you have Muhammad Hijab. He yeah. comes up with this brilliant idea. Well, I'll just get him on here and he'll explain exactly what he means and he'll clarify right, this. Right. When it's like the two worlds of Yasser Qadi suddenly collided, right? Yeah. He's got his scholarly his scholarly persona where he knows about the actual history of the Quran. Right. And then he's got this public persona where, yes, perfect preservation right down to the letter. And then he gets on here and gets called, hey, tell us exactly what the reality is and what your views are. And he knows he's in trouble. He can't say, of course, there are, of course, there are different Qurans in different parts of the world and all these changes. And yes, it was a, a big disaster trying to preserve the Quran. Um, he can't say that because the Muslim community would eat him alive for that. Right. Um, but he can't say, yes, perfect preservation right down to the letter, because he would that would be an embarrassment to the scholarly community. So he just has to say, guys, we can't talk about this. Come on, come on, Hijab. We yep. can't talk about yep. this. We can't talk. Yep. This is not a good topic. This is not wise. It's not wise to talk about this. And so we're 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 witnessing all of this coming together. And that's just an example, but that's basically uh, a microcosm of what's what's going on in the Muslim world. It's all these claims that have uh that have that have spread in the Muslim community that are just myths. Right. And them being confronted with the reality and not liking it. And, you, you know, it, it hasn't this is this is just the beginning because, you know, he was he was shamed and humiliated because of that. Yeah. When what he was saying is, I'm not going to say perfect preservation. I'm going to leave it at that. He didn't want to go into any more detail, but simply not saying perfect preservation right down to the letter was enough for the Muslim community to realize that there's a problem. And so that belief is still common enough where you can't you can't say it. And and yet all their all their scholars know that. Anyone yeah, who's read the hadith sure. knows that. Anyone who's examined Muslim manuscripts know that knows that. They all and so it's this amazing yeah. situation of all their leaders and scholars know something that they can't say publicly because of how much they how much time they spent lying to the community over right. the years. Right. And so who's bringing Muslims? And this is something where, you know, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, he, 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 he has to start trying to be more uh, honest. But you've seen Shabir Ali. Shabir yeah. Ali has come out acknowledging that there are yeah. different Qurans yeah, and so right. on. Um, but Shabir is actually smarter than a lot of the Muslim leaders because he's realizing, wait a minute, if we keep saying perfect preservation, and the non-Muslims are coming up saying, wait, look, look at this. Look at what your sources say. Or just putting two manuscripts yeah. side by side and pointing them. Or putting two, two different different kirat in front of them and saying, hey, Warsh says this, Haf says this. Yeah. Then it looks like the unbelievers are honest and we're all liars. So we have to start acknowledging that. And so that's I, I think that's the basis for Shabir mm -hmm. uh, being a little more public. But um, yeah, they, I mean, they need to come up with something because if, yeah. they, if, that's, if their game plan is just yeah, let's stick with the myths that we spread 40 years ago and 30 years ago. And we'll just keep saying these things that we know are false because the Muslim community will will jump on us if we if we don't say these false things. Uh, if they don't get past that, then I, I, I see no way for it. But notice what's the alternative? Now they come out and say, yeah, we've been lying to you forever. <laughs> You're just, yeah. this is a disaster for them, man. Yeah. It is, man, it is fun, to it is fun to watch and be a part Definitely. of it. Yeah, you know, James, James chapter one says that a uh, double-minded person is like the waves of the sea. They're unstable. And and that's what we see here. We see these double-minded imams like Sheikh uh, Yasser Qadi saying one thing, putting on one hat when it comes to the pop popular Islamic community and then putting on the academic hat when dealing with with academia, uh, and so once again, uh, you, you, we see this inconsistency, and that's another myth. I think, uh, David, that's I think bringing about the collapse of Islam is that the Quran does not berate the scriptures of the people of the book. The the Quran uh, calls them the word of Allah. It refers to them as a light and a guidance that the people of the gospel are to judge by what Allah has revealed therein. Uh, and of course, Surah 29, verse 46, I think presents to us the greatest Islamic dilemma ever, uh, that the Muslims are supposed to say to us, the people of the book, they're supposed to say, we believe in what has been sent down to, to you and sent down to us, and your God and our God is one. And so they're supposed to say to us, David, they're supposed to say, hey, David, Tony, uh, I believe in what has been sent down to you, and I believe in what has been sent down to, uh, to us, and our God is one. 
but that's not what they say. That's not what they do. And so I think that what you find is that Muslims in the end are actually disobeying a lot. They're saying the very exact opposite of what he tells them they should be saying. That is, they should be acknowledging our scriptures. And so uh, I think that is one of the greatest shocks that a lot of our Muslim friends find is that their Quran does not uh, berate or it does not uh, uh, charge um, the scriptures were being corrupted. And, you know, in Surah 2, when it talks about they write the book with their hand, well, many commentators have noted that that's probably a reference to other books like the Talmud or the Mishnah. But the, the text of the scriptures themselves, um, the Quran seems to be very clear that these texts are intact and, and have not been corrupted. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, they, they, they go with that interpretation uh, of Surah 2, when that interpretation, their interpretation, inter interpreting this as the, as the corruption would contradict all of Surah 2. You don't even need to go yeah. to the rest of the Quran. Yeah. Surah 2, over and over again, uh, Allah repeatedly tells Muhammad to say that he's affirming the scriptures that they have in their possession. And just a few verses, of, just a few verses after 279, um, it, it condemns Jews for thinking that they don't have to obey all the Torah and that they can pick and choose. And so that they'll, it's this amazing situation where you have these, you have these, these, there's only a couple of verses that they go to, to say, you see, you see the Quran affirms the corruption of the scripture. When, if you read those passages in context, if you look at what they meant to Muhammad's followers and you compare it with what the rest of the Quran said, you could never in a million years get that, uh, get that interpretation. Um, because, you know, if, if, the, if the Quran is consistently affirming the inspiration, preservation and authority of the Jewish and Christian texts, uh, you need to look at what it's you need to look at what it's saying in these passages. And so that, that's that's 279. Um, the, the other most popular one they go to is uh, is in Surah three, where it says that they twist the scriptures with their tongues. And they go, ah, you see that it's saying your scriptures have been corrupted. No, it says twist mm -hmm. it with their tongues. Right. Yeah, and and totally if different. you're. If you're saying that that means the text has been corrupted, uh, aren't there Muslims who twist the Quran with their tongues? Aren't there Muslims who who, oh, yeah. who, who twist it with their tongues? And so yeah. does that mean the Quran's been corrupted? And then they say, no, not the Quran. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the amazing thing is, I mean, according to the Quran, the Quran, I mean, one, the Quran says that the Torah and the gospel are still authoritative for Jews and Christians and that Christians and Jews have to judge by the Torah and the gospel. As, as you point out, we have no ground to stand upon mm -hmm. uh, unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel. That's what the Quran says. But the Quran was authoritative over Muhammad himself. I mean, the, the Torah, I mean, the Torah and the gospel were authoritative over Muhammad himself in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Surah 10 verse 94, Muhammad was having doubts and Allah says, if you're in doubt about what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. So it's Christians and Jews. Now, that makes no sense if we have a corrupt book. If, it, if we have a corrupt book, it makes no sense to say, hey, Muhammad, if you're if you're doubting your revelations, go make sure they line up with their revelations. Right. It will make no sense if we have a corrupt book. Um, and so it's just it's just an epic, an epic disaster. And, and again, in the 70s and 80s, Christians Christians didn't know what's in the Quran. So if a, if a Muslim comes up and says, ah, our book says your book's been corrupted. Yeah. Um, no one's in a position to, to correct that. Uh, if, if they go up and say, ah, there's only one copy of our book ever. It's, it's perfectly preserved right down to the letter. No one's in a position to respond to that. But all of a sudden, we're in a position where we get to expose these lies and this nonsense. Uh, this nonsense and it's just uh yeah it's a it is a yeah. fun fun time it sure is and and then you know something like the 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 death of jesus the crucifixion in surah 4 157 when it says they crucified him not nor did they kill him and then it goes on to say and those who are in doubt thereof are, are full of conjecture well christians have never been in doubt about the death of jesus all christians have affirmed the death burial and resurrection of christ which is the the heart of the gospel the only ones who are filled with conjectures, David, are the Muslims. I mean, the yeah. Islamic sources say, oh, it was Judas Iscariot. No, no, no. It was a, it was Simon of Cyrene who ended up on the cross. No, it was a, it was a rabbi. No, it was a Roman soldier. Uh, and then you've got the Ahmad, Ahmadiyas, uh, the Swin theory, and Shabir adopts that. And well. Shabir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Shabir adopts that. Jesus really was on the cross. He was nailed to the cross, but he swooned. He passed out on the cross. The only people I find, uh, David, that seem to fit the bill of Surah 4157, uh, chapter four, uh, verse one fifty seven. Are the Muslims? They're the ones who are filled with conjectures. Yeah, not, because you, you can go to the you can go to the entire scholarly world. It doesn't matter if you're conservative Christian, liberal Christian, 
Jewish scholar, atheist scholar, agnostic scholar, everyone acknowledges that as a, as a historical fact. You could take the, the scholars that Muslims love to go to if they can find some some quote they can use from some people like Bart Ehrman and so on. They regard the, the crucifixion of Jesus as one of the best established facts of, of history Absolutely. Um, at the scholarly level. So you're right. I mean, like Muslims are saying the, the unbelievers are the ones in a state of uh, uncertainty and conjecture when we're all in total agreement and it's a it's a it's a historical fact um but muslims can't figure out what in the world's going on yeah and and they'll acknowledge that you can you can line up you can line up 10 muslims and get 10 different views of what happened to jesus and the quran says that muslims are the ones with certainty and uh this is this is silly stuff yeah it sure is and also david i was thinking we were talking a little bit about how the quran islam cannot cannot bear to be criticized. I mean, we think of right after the death of Muhammad in 632 AD, uh, you had the, the Ridda Wars, uh, where uh, Muslims were saying, you know what, um, I'm not, I think I'm going to quit Islam. I'm just going to go back to my ancestral religions and so forth. And of course, Abu Bakr said, uh -uh, uh, we're going to come after you and we're going to make sure you stay Muslim or else we're going to kill you. And so you have this the, the Riddle Wars where you've got the, the Caliph Abu Bakr uh, going around the empire and basically ensuring that all Muslims stay within the faith or they, they will be killed for apostasy. You know, Yusuf uh, Kardawi, the, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood who just passed away recently, uh, if you remember, one of his famous statements was, were it not for the law of apostasy, Islam would cease to exist. And you know what, David? I think he said the quiet part out loud. I totally mm -hmm. agree with him. Were it not for the law of apostasy, I think most Muslims today would probably leave. They're afraid to leave because they know that it will end up uh, resulting in their death. No, it, it would. I mean, it, it would have ended very early on. I mean, as as you know, just just going to Abu Bakr, if all these people were allowed to leave Islam and wouldn't be killed for it, they tried. They were trying to leave Islam, and they were they were put back into their place. But um, I mean, Muhammad was great at coming up and hey what do you like it's the same thing we talked about what they do today hey whatever you like that that's what that's what islam teaches to get you to convert but muhammad was great notice you can go in there and and with muhammad it would be you know claiming some knowledge like they'd ask him questions what's the first meal of paradise and he was ah you know fish lobe and they go oh wow how could he know this you can't test that right yeah um so he would but he would sound confident in the answers he's given, and this is enough to persuade uh, the pagans of his time, oh, wow, this guy sounds really, really confident. By the time you start to realize, and we find this in the Muslim sources, right? By the time people start to realize, wait a minute, come on, this is stupid, right? Uh, by the time you realize something's wrong, you can't leave because you, yeah. you, you'll, you'll be killed. And so, yeah, they were able to, uh, they were, were able to uh, keep that going for a really long time. Uh, and by the way, as, as far as Abu Bakr is concerned, the the, the same thinking, the same thinking, uh, led to ISIS. Right? I mean, yeah. uh, the, the the leader of ISIS was not coincidentally went with the name Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. He's the al right. he's the Abu Bakr of Baghdad. Uh, but the idea was, I mean, we look around all this killing, and they're going around killing Shias, and they're uh, they're doing all this horrible stuff. That Western leaders think, you see, this means they're not Muslim. They were doing exactly what Abu Bakr did because the idea was that Islam only had this great period of expansion because Abu Bakr went and cleansed the, the Muslim community of all apostasy and heresy and so on. And then Allah blessed that community so that they could go out and expand rapidly. And so the idea of ISIS was we need to do the same thing now. We need to go out and just cleanse the Islamic community of all impurity. And then Allah will bless us to go out and conquer the world. Didn't work out uh, because it's all fa it's false. It's 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 a false religion. Um, that's that's it's not actually going to be uh, blessed by God. Right. Um, but but notice it's the same. It's the same thinking that's fourteen hundred years later is still leading to uh, to total bloodshed. Hey, yeah, you, know, you you mentioned questions. I see a, a interesting question to respond yeah. to here. Can we can okay, we read this? Go, ahead. Uh, go right ahead, David. Uh, did, can you bring it on the screen? Or you want me to bring it on? I don't believe I can believe I don't uh, believe I can put stuff on the screen. Which one is that, David? It's uh, Edward the Second. Okay, right up there. here. Okay, let's bring him yeah. on here. Yeah. So uh, he says, um, "What is your opinion on the phenomenon of Jesus appearing to Muslims in dreams 
isn't this revelation outside the bounds of scripture and shouldn't Christians exercise discernment on this? So a couple of issues here. Uh, one, yes, you do have Muslims uh, having, in fact, Nabil had multiple dreams and I was, I mean, when he would have, he would call me and say, Hey, what do you think of this? Mm -hmm. And some of them, uh, like, like, like his first one was very, very, uh, um, metaphorical and so on. And so right. when he, when he described that to me, the only thing that would have concerned me if I were him was it was, it was telling him to do the opposite of what he wanted to do. Right. It was telling right. him that Jesus is going to chop the head off of Islam. Um, so, you know, as far as back then, I mean, Nabil was clinging to Islam and defending Islam and giving us presentations on the scientific miracles in Islam. So for him to have a dream uh, telling him that, you know, suggesting that Islam is false and so on. Like, OK, maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, is this that a, you eat something weird or something? I, I don't know. I don't know what the cause of that was. Uh, it was actually his the second dream he had where. He, he hadn't read that passage in Luke with the narrow door and people's, you know, at the feast of sure. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And he calls me on the phone. He's like, hey, do Christians believe that God can give dreams? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, you see it in the Bible. I don't know a lot about it, but you see it in the Bible. So and he goes and then he explains the dream and he's like telling me exactly what's in Luke. And he never read it. And it was in his dream where he's he's shut outside and he's looking yeah. inside at the feast. And I'm in there at the feast. And so that's where I'm going, okay, he never read that. And he dreamed himself right into a parable of Jesus that he's never read before. So then I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting stuff. Uh, but yeah, you, 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 you do have this uh, in the Muslim world. So I would say that's it's really good. And a lot of times it seems to be, because guess what? I mean, if I had a dream telling me to leave Christianity, I would think, okay, what a stupid dream, right? But you, you, right. Have, you have people who... Um, have a higher view of that sort of thing. And people who, like Nabil, Nabil's position was, hey, I'm a human being. I have biases. I'm biased and so on. And so if, if I'm going to know something, then, then I mean, I, I really wish God would would tell me and just give, yeah. me a, give me some sort of indication of what I'm supposed to do. Um, uh, so the, we have to realize that there are people in the world who take this sort of thing more mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. um, but the second issue, isn't this revelation outside the bounds of scripture? Um, no, this is this, this not it's it's not the same thing as revelation. If someone came up and said they have a revelation and they've got a new book of the Bible or something like that, it's a different kind of revelation. So, you know, even in the book of Acts, you have people who are prophets, you have people who are um who who are um giving information about the future and they're giving accurate information about the future. I'm not talking about like the apostles. I'm talking about there, there, were prof there were prophets. There were still prophets right. going around. These are not prophets bringing new revelation in terms of new doctrine. Um, so no, you, I don't think you can use that as a response to it and say, ah, but this is new revelation. It's, 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 not, the, it's not revelation in the sense of like a new Bible coming right. along. Um, with that said, saying shouldn't Christians exercise discernment on this, that is, that, that's absolutely correct right there. Um, because, um, I mean, if, if you're saying, hey, this person had a dream and we're not going to exercise discernment, I'm, my goodness, you, you know, that's how cults get started, right? Yeah. Uh, so you have to, what, what, whatever this person is dreaming it yeah it can't be some new revelation that contradicts uh the bible but if if someone if someone who is not a christian someone's a muslim and he starts telling me about a dream he's had and it's telling him to believe in jesus and to accept jesus and that muhammad's a false prophet and so on uh un, i mean until i see some indication that something's something's wrong uh I mean, I, I I believe in God. I believe God can can give messages to people and, and tell people that they're that they're wrong about things. So you know, I, I see yeah. no problem taking it seriously. Yeah, I totally agree with you, David. I think that uh, uh, Jesus appearing in dreams. Remember, we're not talking about a resurrection appearance that ended with the Apostle Paul. He was the last to see the risen Christ in his resurrected physical form. Uh, but dreams and visions are something that the Bible speaks about. People experiencing even after the New Testament was closed. And the important thing to realize is that God is absolutely sovereign. He can do whatever he wants, when he wants, how he wants. And there are cases where Muslims have come to faith in Christ through these visions or dreams. 
I've met some of them. They they suffered greatly. They wouldn't have gone to prison and lost their wife and children just because of a weird dream that they had. These dreams really affected them. There are hoaxes as well. There are people who've made themselves very rich, taught, writing books about going to heaven and seeing Jesus and Jesus appearing to them in dreams, and they become very lucrative, very rich. We're not talking about those. We're talking about bona fide experiences where the Lord uh, has, uh, in many cases, revealed himself. Now, by revelation, what David doesn't mean, and I certainly don't mean, is we're not saying that, uh, you know, if David got a dream from God, then now we're going to have the book of David, chapter 3, verse 16. We're not saying that we're going to have a 67th book of the Bible. The canon has closed. Inspired scripture has ended. And so what we're trying to say here is that the Lord, whenever we use our discernment, we we test everything by scripture. And so, like David said, if, if you know, Nabil had a dream about some wide, wide door or wide gate, well, that goes against what Scripture says, that narrow is the way that leads to life, and, men, and few find it, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. So, so what we're saying is this. Absolutely, Edward, if that's your name, Edward II, uh, if, if there is um, uh, a claim that, that Christ has appeared in a dream of some sort, we do need to test it by Scripture. How do we know it's from God when it comports with Scripture and when uh, that person becomes a follower of Christ and glory is given to God? God receives all the glory. Uh, that That is a good indicator that what we're dealing with is a, is a real thing, a bona fide experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have another question here, uh, David, Rick, soldier of God. What Quran verses or Hadith prescribe killing blasphemers or say that it's halal? Google only leads to articles by New York Times and other claiming it's not Islamic. Um, yeah, so you have, I mean, you, you have to actually go through the Muslim sources, but you have a passage in, um, uh, Sunan Abu Dawud where a man kills the mother of his children for speaking against Muhammad. Um, and Muhammad shows up at first. They just, there's a, there's a dead, there's a dead slave girl and it's who, who murdered this girl. And then the man says, uh, well, yeah, I told her to quit quit making fun of you, Muhammad, but she wouldn't. So I stabbed her to death. And then Muhammad says, hey, no retaliation against this man. So it was perfectly acceptable. Um, in Ibn Asak, there, there's a passage in Ibn Asak where Muhammad is conquering Mecca and he gives a list of people. So he's Muhammad's conquering Mecca and he's saying, hey, you know, don't go on a killing spree. Don't go on a killing spree. Everyone, uh, you know, this, this, this was my city. I don't want to go on a, I don't want to go on a killing spree here, but he gives a list of people that were to be killed, even if they went and, you know, were, were clinging to the Kaaba and so on. Um, and you look at the, the people who he named as far as people who have to be killed. There were several of them on that list who all they did was make fun of Muhammad, right? And and he couldn't take it. And it, it had clearly been bothering him for years. And now he had power over them. And so he was saying, um, that that they have to be killed. So it's, it's more it's more along the lines of understanding that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct in Islam, and so when he's going around killing uh, critics and so on, that okay, that's 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 supposed to be the rule. In fact, um, there's a there's a hadith where someone made fun of Abu Bakr. Someone made fun of Abu Bakr, and his companion said, "Hey, should we kill this guy?" And Abu Bakr said, "No, that was only for Muhammad." In other words, someone makes fun of Muhammad. Yeah, we kill him, but not not me. I'm not I'm not that important. And so mm -hmm. it, it was it was understood by then. Hey, someone makes fun of Muhammad. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a death sentence. And what's ironic too, David, is uh, they can make fun of Allah, uh, and you can get away with that. Uh, you can get a couple stripes, a couple you know, a couple stripes. But uh, you mock Muhammad in Pakistan. You've got the blasphemy code law, where you can be imprisoned and and eventually killed. Um, so it's quite interesting that we hear Muslims say, we don't worship Muhammad, we're not like you Christians, you worship Christ, we don't worship Muhammad, and yet the penalty for uh, blaspheming Muhammad is on a far greater uh, degree and scale than that of mocking Allah, which which seems to indicate that Muhammad is is either greater than Allah or is, or is at least on par with Allah. And, and by the way, I was told that, I was told that in... Uh, the first class I ever took on Islam. So when I was an undergraduate, um, my degree, uh, I mean, I was a double major in biology and philosophy, but in philosophy, it was philosophy with an emphasis in religious studies. So I was taking classes on various religions and so on. And uh, uh, 
I, I, I believe it was the same year I met Nabil. I was taking the Islam class, which was taught by a Muslim professor. And he was he was the one who was pointing that out. He said where, wherever he was, from, I think it was from Pakistan, but he said they had a saying, say it about God, but don't say it about Muhammad. Right. And so he, he was pointing he was pointing out and he wasn't agreeing with it. He was just saying this is how it is um, that we you could even you can even say something negative about Allah and you'd be OK. But if you say it about Muhammad, then there's going to be there's going to be violence. And it's just it's just amazing that they can be so idolatrous and not not pick up on it. Yeah. Yeah. And in the Bible, isn't it interesting, David, it's the exact opposite in the Bible, you know, Leviticus 24, 16 says, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And, and so the penalty in the Old Testament was for blaspheming the name of God, blaspheming God, uh, for claiming to be a prophet, speaking in the name of the Lord and those prophecies not coming to pass. And so the Bible seems to have the, the highest view of God's honor and name. Whereas in Islam, and again, this is what really gets me is that they don't like the term Mohammedan. You know, the old in the old books, we used to refer to Islam as Mohammedan Mohammedanism. And uh, they oh, we don't like that term because it insinuates that we are worshiping Mohammed. But it, it certainly seems that way. And when you look at the Shahada, David, as you know, the the the, the you have the conjunction there, the 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 conjunction and which is is basically placing Muhammad on the same level with Allah. And this is why the Qur'anis reject that. In fact, the Qur'anis think that the Shahada is blasphemy it, it, the way it stands today. It is. I mean, I mean, it is, it is mind boggling. You could take, you could take a group of Muslims and show them some other group. If that group were bowing down to a big cube, I mean, it, you, you could replace the Kaaba with anything and show a ton of people bowing down to it and Muslims would immediately recognize this as some some pagan idolatrous nonsense uh, for some reason nope it's just our direction of prayer well, notice they're saying ah it's just our direction of prayer you could you could do that with anything right but yeah. if i said if i said okay here's a new direction of prayer uh, we're all going to bow down to this cup they would recognize hey if we're all bowing down to this cup we've got a problem here um they would recognize that if if any if they saw any group in the world uh climbing over each other to kiss a rock, they would recognize it immediately as paganism. But it, it, nope, our prophet did it. So it's 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 pure monotheism. Yeah. And then you get to Muhammad. They literally talk to Muhammad during their prayers. Yep. They, yep. they sp direct address, speak directly to him. Um, and yet and you go back to the time of Muhammad and they were uh, they would grab his saliva and rub it all over their bodies. If he bled, they would drink his blood and so on. And it was, I mean, you can't get more pagan than that. No. And yet it's the religion of pure monotheism. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I, I've wanted to make, you can actually look, I haven't, I haven't made a video on this yet, but I, I've been wanting to this sort of replacement paganism of Muhammad because you have, you, you're familiar of course, with the, the story of the satanic verses yeah. where Muhammad goes out to his followers and tells them it's actually okay to pray to Alat, Alusa, and Manat, these three pagan goddesses, yep. because they'll, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're like birds. They'll carry your prayers up to Allah. So they're like these bird goddesses. And as long as you understand that Allah's the main God, then it's okay to have these, these intermediaries and intercessors who are going to carry your prayers up there, right? Well, right. So, so Muhammad delivered that. And then he comes back and says, oops, the devil made me do it. But later when he's talking about the Quran, he describes chapters of the Quran as flocks of birds who will intercede for Muslims on the mm. day of, of judgment. And so he's talking about Surah, uh, Surah al-Baqarah and so on as this, this, these flocks of birds who intercede for Muslims. Now, so, so think about that, right? One, you've got, you've got the, the idea that the Quran is eternal, but Muhammad says that the Quran will appear as a pale man. So he can, he can appear as a, the Quran can appear as a pale man, but then you have individual chapters of the Quran will appear as flocks of birds and they're, they're speaking and they're talking and they're, they're interacting with people and interceding and talking to Allah on behalf of the believers and so on. And the, the implication is that uh, since, you know, these surahs are flocks of birds that like, Individual verses are individual birds. Yes. But notice, what do you have here? 
What did you have with the satanic verses? Yeah, there's, a, there's, yeah there's a law and yeah. there's you. And in between you are these birds that carry yeah. your prayers up there. Yes. And then and then Muhammad eventually, oh, no, that's just satanic pagan nonsense. The devil tricked me into delivering that. But let me tell you about the Quran, because these chapters of the Quran, you know what they are? They're like these flocks of birds in between yeah. you and Allah. And they intercede for it. It's like it's the same exact it's pagan nonsense. Yeah, but you're all you're saying is it's not a goddess; it's living personal Quran verses. Yeah, like like that. That somehow, <laughs> this yeah, is, this is wild stuff. Well, man. David, it's like in Zoolander. You know, it's the same look. You know, the same calendar, yeah. but the mm -hmm. same pose, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also the 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 stone, the the black stone of the Kaaba. It will, one day it'll speak. It'll have a mouth, and it will testify uh, about uh, before Allah about those who smooched it and kissed it. Um, and so even Omar, Omar had enough sense to know that when he went to do the Hajj, and mind you, David, the Muslims were doing the Hajj and circambulating the Kaaba with the idols still in there. Mm -hmm. And the Caliph Umar, he went there and he, he himself said when he approached the rock, the black stone, Umar said, I know that you're nothing but a rock. But if I did not see the messenger of Allah kiss you, I would not kiss you. So it goes back to the point you made, uh, David, that... The reason why they do it is simply to imitate the prophet. He did it. And so if he did it, it must be good enough for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on again with some questions. And then uh, I don't want to keep you too long, David. Uh, in debates, how would you balance your focus on the Islamic audience chest thumping rhetoric equals winning or the Western audience chest thumping rhetoric equals losing? Who gets more of the focus? Um, yeah, so very early on, very early on, in my debates, um, I was trying to be very reasonable and, and I was thinking about the Muslims that I knew, right? Um, very nice Muslims like Nabil's family and so on. And so when I would debate, I'm thinking about them and hey, I don't want to hurt their feelings. And there, there's there's these Muslim ladies in the front row and stuff and they're, you know, nice people. And um, so I wanted to get the information across to them, but I didn't want to be a jerk about it. And so I would present the information and I would say, OK, so, um, you know, this is something that bothers me here. And I would talk about Aisha and I would talk about Muhammad's hypocrisy and I talk about Muhammad taking the wife of his own adopted son. Mm -hmm. But I was doing it very, very gently and so on. And afterwards, the Muslims walk out. Ha ha. He's so weak. He doesn't believe what he's saying. And it was after a couple debates where I went and I presented the exact same information, but I did it totally differently. I was just like, how can you believe in this? My goodness, what a, and I presented the exact same information. I just presented it in a, in a more, you know, mocking tone and so on, but I kept a smile on my face. So it was a good time. So I wasn't like angry. Yeah. And then the, the Muslims were walking around. I was like, oh, he's destroying our religion. And I was thinking, wait, is, is that all you're looking at? You're just looking at like how you're looking at how I present it and so on. So, so then for a while I was, uh, you know, I could be a, a pretty, pretty big jerk in debates and so on. And, um, and then eventually, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not saying be, I'm not saying be like this, but eventually like, like in more, you know, past five or six years, it's just, uh, you know, whereas 12 years ago, it was like, ah, I have to go in and crush their religion and humiliate their guy and so on. Uh, now I've I've come to regard all of that all of that chest chest thumping um, as like a weakness in their community. So you need to be aware of it, and it, it's good it's good to it's good if you can you know thump your chest too and so on. But it's just which is probably why since my thinking has changed, I'm probably not the best guy to be out there because because a lot of people are paying attention to the chest thumping. But now it's hard to describe. Now I'm thinking much more long term. And I go in there, and if their guy is thumping his chest, ah, oh, me so strong, me strong than you, ha <laughs> ha, you dumb, me strong, right? When their guy is talking like that, I'm thinking, okay, everyone who's impressed by this, great, be impressed by it. That's not going to last. It's not going to last. If if that's if that's what's going to make this guy popular, my goodness, make him please become popular, because I want their entire debate squad to be a bunch of those guys, a bunch of chest thumping. Um, about, you know, about me strong. I want, I want yeah. those guys representing your religion. So now I'm, now it's more of a, I'm willing to put myself out there as a target for guys to thump their chest at 
um, and to boost their egos if it's a certain kind of guy. If it's someone who's like narcissistic and who is going to get some attention and then it's going to go to his mind and then he's going to thump his chest even more and get even more aggressive as the Muslim community cheers him on even more. And then eventually the Muslim community is going to realize, wait a minute, this guy's a problem. This guy's an egomaniac thumping his chest and embarrassing us. But by that time, it's too late because there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Um, anyway, that, that's that's where my thinking has gone more in my old age. It's not that I'm saying that's what Christians need to do. It's like, OK, let other people go in there and be the, you know, be the guy who who crushes people. Other people do that. Um me, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's like, it's like chess, but it's like, it's almost like this. It's like, it's like Muslims don't control who their apologists are. I control. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that sounds, yeah. that sounds weird, but I actually believe you could take any Muslim apologist out there, especially someone who's going to be a, just a narcissistic disaster. And I believe I could make him, I could make him popular. Um, and so it's and not by being deceptive or, or anything else, just by who I choose to interact with, uh, what that person is able to get away with and so on. And so it's just, uh, I mean, I mean, just look, I mean, you know, you, you go back 20 years, you, you know, Tony, who are huh. they putting forward? They're putting together Shabir Ali, these gentlemanly nice guys who are making a, a great impression for Islam on people. And look at who they look at who they have now. Look at the champions of their religion now. Yeah. Uh, and they wonder why they wonder why it's collapsing. But I, yeah, I, I, it, it was it was it was it was more along the lines of like, if you go back to like 2006, 2007, 2008, I was acknowledging it as a problem back then. Like, hey, everyone they put forward to defend their religion is like selected by Muslim organizations to be deliberate misrepresentations of what Islam is actually like. Mm -hmm. And it was in my mind, how do you get like people who would represent Islam accurately to be the public face of Islam so that people realize what it what it's actually like? Right. And I, di I didn't know how to do that. And there, there, are, there are things along the way. But yeah, in, in recent years, it's um, when someone has the. What, what I'm. <laughs> What what I want in a Muslim leader, Muslim apologist, one got to be narcissistic. I mean, that does you you have yeah. to be a you have to be a narcissist because those are the people, the people who are in it for glory, uh, the people who want want a, a group of followers cheering them on no matter what they do. Um, mm -hmm. If you have someone like that and has no power and no following, it's pretty harmless. If you get a small group of those guys and they become the public face of Islam, it's, it's, it's over. It's done. I can, I, I do not need to, I do not need to make videos anymore. Yeah. I, I, all, I, all I'm viewing myself as doing right now is accelerating the process because Tony, you could retire. I could retire. We can sit back. The pieces are already in place. Yeah. They're, they're, they're popular apologists and dais are egomaniacs who are obsessed with their own fame and with putting down everyone else. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is sit, sit back and watch that right now. It's yeah. too late. It's too yeah. late. It's yeah. too late. It's, it's already going to happen. So, 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 you know, as an example, you have recently this dispute between Ali Dawa and Sajid, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the Muslim community. So you have, you know, Ali Dawa's fans and then Sajid's fans and Sajid's fans are supporting him and Ali Dawa's fans are supporting him. But you have, you know, the bulk of the Muslim community saying, guys, this is an embarrassment. Stop this. Yeah. Stop it. Stop attacking each other publicly. But notice, so notice the idea is for the good of the Muslim community, we need to squash this. But what happens if you squash it? Ali Dawa is only going to get more popular by the time he embarrasses you. He, he does something so embarrassing because he was embarrassing. He's doing he keeps doing really stupid, embarrassing stuff to the point where Sajid says, I can't I can't be quiet about this anymore. Yeah. And I have to speak out against this. And when he does that, the whole Muslim, ah, don't, don't cause disputes. Well, if you don't deal with it now, what happens? You're going to deal with Ali Dawa two or three years from now yeah. when yeah. he's more popular, when he has two or three million followers, that's when you're going to deal with him. That's the point. It's in order to deal with these guys now, they would have to just wreak havoc on the Muslim yeah. community with, with, with fighting and arguing. They don't right. want to do that because they're already dealing with the avalanche of apostasy. We can't deal with yeah. this stuff right now. Yeah. But guess what? You're not. You think you got a problem now? Wait five years from now. Wait yeah. five years yeah. from now. It's, you, it, and so it's. 
I'm no, I'm no, I'm just not in a, I'm not in a rush to, uh, yeah. I'm not in a rush to crush it, to crush Islam. I'm not a, I'm not in a rush anymore to expose yeah. Islam. It's more like, uh, it's more, I'm like looking at the whole picture and saying, uh, here's a little piece I can add right here. Here's another little piece I can add to this puzzle. Uh, maybe we need to respond to this objection, but you know, I get to, I, I get to be pretty calm about all this because I'm looking at the religion imploding. Yeah, it's like the the Titanic has struck the iceberg and it's just slowly sinking, you know. And uh, you know, I could just hear Ali Dawa, da uh, Ali Dawa David saying, "We're proud of it." Yeah, We're proud of it. <laughs> I mean, but that, that, by the way, that's that's a that's a perfect example because you know, because you were you were doing this long before. I mean, you were doing this before I was even uh, a Christian, uh, let alone you know dealing with Islam. Um, but. You know, back in the day, all their apologists. No, there's no death penalty. Yeah, there's no death penalty for apostasy in Islam. That's that's Islamophobic nonsense, and so on. And now that now they can brag about it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're gonna kill you, little weaklings, and yes, you'll be executed. Blah blah blah. And we're proud of that. And we're their followers, their followers love that. And so they're we're proud they're, of that. They're just the, the the public face of Islam is yeah. changing. And yeah. and. Time. And uh, Big time. I mean, just look at Shabir Ali. It. Look at Shabir Ali, what he was in the early 90s to what he is today. In the early 90s, he openly admitted, he said, if you're not a Muslim, you're going to hell. And uh, he was very aggressive. And today he he's very open. He's uh, an ecumenist. He's uh, an, apparently an open theist in, in, in regards to God's foreknowledge. Uh, today, he's uh, he's pretty, pretty mellowed out, David. And this is something that I saw coming a long time ago that eventually Shabir would mellow out and just become, just join with the crowd. And so this is where we're at today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, David. Oh, I just want to, it, it's, it's really cool because um, um, <laughs> like the people who, like my friends who, who know me, they'll be like, ah, oh, I just found this out about this guy. I'm going to put, and I'll be, no, 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 let that go, man. Let that go. <laughs> Not right now. Not right now. Let let it let it let it let it go for a little while. I actually view, I actually view the the popular dais as like gold mines, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't you don't you don't, the, the the goal of having a good gold mine is to to have it keep producing. You want it to yeah. keep producing, and so it's more like, hey, go over to this gold mine, mine a little bit of gold, mine a little bit of gold, and then and then leave it alone, leave it alone, and then go over here and go to this mine, get a little bit of gold, get a little bit of gold, get a little bit of gold, and just keep going, going that. And so you know, I'll, like I'll leave someone alone for 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 two years or something like that, and then mm -hmm. and then go and oh, I have to I have to do this, but it's uh, yeah. So no, we don't we don't we don't want these guys destroyed i mean we don't, we, we don't want the dais crushed and humiliated we want them to become extremely popular in their religion because notice this is this is a great time to be a dai you talked about people who you know could ah, i've had dreams and visions and you could become really popular like that and so mm -hmm. on but you know we're talking about right now the muslim community is panicking because of what they call the avalanche of apostasy. They're worried, and this is understandable, they're worried about their kids and uh, their kids leaving Islam and so on. And that's all understandable. But because the community is in such a state of panic, it makes them susceptible to championing whoever looks like the next Dai who's going to crush the unbelievers. And so it's a great time if you can walk out and say, ah, I'm the one who will crush the Kufar and show them the truth. Then they'll, the, the, the Muslim community will rally around that person, make that person very popular, very lucrative and so on. Um, so you, you're going to, you're going to keep seeing these new Dais uh, arrive, but that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make sure they're all narcissists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, David. David, uh, do, how long do we have you tell us? Do you good for 1030 or do you have to go earlier than that? 1030 is cool. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't know what time zone you're in. I'm in the Eastern Standard time zone. So you mean, you mean 1030 as in 17 minutes from now? Yes. Yeah, that's good. That's a, you're that's good. A good. Are you, time. are you, you're, are you also Eastern Standard time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So 1030. Why don't you give them my address, Tony? Okay. I'll talk to you. I'll try to talk to you. <laughs> okay. Let's check it, take a look at this question. Is the Mahdi and the Quran equivalent to the Antichrist of the Bible? 
Um, I have to. That's one of the areas I've never I've never studied a lot is end times prophecy in the Bible or in the Quran. So I could give you my limited views, but I'd rather not even talk about it because I'm I'm thinking. Okay, I don't like to talk about stuff that I haven't yeah. really. I haven't yeah. really studied. I'll, what take, I'll take a jab at that, David. Yeah. So, Edward, uh, the Mahdi in the Quran, uh, the Mahdi and the Antichrist are two different figures in the Quran. So, in the Quran, Jesus comes back and he fights a, a figure called Al Dajjal, which is the Arabic term for the Antichrist, and uh, he will kill him at the gates of Lud. And uh, he is described in some Islamic sources as having a protruding eye. He's a kind of a a bit of a freak from a from a Marvel comic world, I suppose. Uh, the Mahdi is a figure that comes after Jesus. So Jesus comes, destroys the Christianity, the, kills the pigs, destroys the, the crosses and so forth. And then he wages war against the, the Al-Dajjal, the Antichrist. And then the Mahdi is the guy who kind of comes on the scene and he puts, a, he caps everything. He He's the final restorer of all things. Uh, all of creation reverts back to Allah. Everyone becomes Muslim, the whole, everything, the universe is Muslim. And so the Mahdi is, if you will, the perfecter. He's the guy that writes the last chapter and brings a total end to everything. So um, that's that's basically the eschatological view of the Mahdi. He is considered distinct from the Dajjal, from the Antichrist. And he, he comes after Jesus because Jesus, remember, he fights and eventually dies. Uh, he Remember, he never died, according to Sunni Islam. Uh, and then he comes, he dies, and then he's buried next to Muhammad in Medina. So he's going to be buried next to Muhammad. And then the Mahdi is to appear, and then he's the guy who sums it up. So hopefully that that has helped answer your question, Edward. Uh, okay, a couple more questions, David. Um, let me see here. Uh, uh, I guess this guy meant this in jest, in fun, uh, taking Yasser Qadi's class. Uh, I think that was meant to just be a joke there. Uh, how about this one here? Um, this is a similar question to what we already had. Do you believe Muslim, Muslim audiences will eventually disown the chest thumpers? Guys like Uth uh, Uthman ibn Th uh, Fib footnote make massive blunders. I think you, you've already answered that question, David. Uh, I, I can expand upon in, in terms of sure. so, so because this, this is the pattern to use, ladies and gentlemen. I won't even talk about Uthman, but you can you can figure it out. If you've, you're going around, you're looking for who should be in a position of prominence in the Muslim community based on how much damage that person is going to do five to 10 years down the road, right? Once this person has a, a big following and so on. And what you do, if you're dealing with a narcissist, if you're dealing with someone who is an actual narcissist, someone who is in it for the attention and so on, you give him a ton of attention. You give him attention, give him attention, give him attention, boost his head, give him attention, give him attention, and then ignore him. And as soon as you ignore him, he's going to start doing things to get the attention back. And he's going to do stupid things. He's going to end up doing some really, really stupid things to keep the attention going. And then you... I don't know how to, you, you just have to watch. <laughs> you, just, you, just, you just have to watch. You get a, so to recap, you get a narcissist, give the narcissist a ton of attention and then just stop and ignore him and watch what happens. Watch, watch what happens to the person. Yeah. He, he yeah. will, he will implode. Remember our friend Menj, uh, uh, David, remember Menj? Oh yeah. When he came out against you and yeah, I'm going to destroy this David Wood guy. <laughs> And then he got charged with possession of child pornography. Yeah. Menj, Menj is different, though. See, see notice, you, you can look at Menj and say, this is a guy who can never be massively popular. So you, don't, no, you, don't need, no. you don't need to think yeah. about them. I don't yeah. know how to describe, but you can you can just sort of pick up on the right personality types. Um, Menj, I, I don't know. Menj is actually, I mean, given how much he boasts about how great he is and stuff like that, I mean, he, he's got some narcissistic tendencies, but it's not combined with the ability to rally people around him so yeah not gonna right. not gonna work okay we got a question on mecca since they have found not uh found i think he means since they have found no historical evidence to show mecca is the oldest city on earth does it not indicate that islam is built on lies as there are no mountain or olive trees uh 
Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I don't know how you'd prove that. So since they have not found historical evidence that Muhammad, that, uh, that Mecca is the oldest city on earth, is this, is this some sort of problem? And I would have to say not. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about details that are supposed to be in the area, I mean, it would be in my mind that, you know, the, the world can change over time and things can get covered up by natural disasters and so on. So it's not a situation where you're always going to know exactly what to expect and, and so on. So, I mean, just, in other words, just imagine how much stuff has happened where there's no evidence for it anymore. Mm -hmm. The evidence has all been just washed away or, or buried. And so my only point here is, I mean, yes, you, you might be able to do archeological criticisms of, you know, Muslim claims and so on. I just think there are way more powerful things to point out about Islam as, as far as problems. So, but, but that's, that I have to say that is an area I haven't really, I've never taken that, that approach. So there may be, there may be more to it than, than I'm aware of, but yeah. 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 I think the question of the, the oldest city on earth, I mean, uh, every, every group makes their special claims. I mean, the ancient Chinese believed China was middle earth. In fact, the word for China contains the symbol of Middle Earth. They believe that they were the center of the earth. And of course, uh, to our Jewish friends, Jerusalem is the center of, of the earth. To Muslims, it's Mecca and so forth. But I think maybe what the, the questioner is asking is that where it says that there are no mountains or olive trees, I think he's talking about the the fact that the Quran describes Mecca as a place that is surrounded with uh, with olive trees and with rivers yeah. and so forth. And I yeah. think... Yeah, I think, and, and, and that that's that's a direction that like Jay Smith and yeah. and some of the people he he goes in yeah. where yeah it does because in the Quran you have it you have it talking about these places that make it sound like these are things that all these all these everyday followers of Muhammad are familiar with and these things they're walking past and these ruins of these other society that they're that they're that they're walking past and it, it it's not anywhere near Mecca and so mm -hmm. I, I, yeah the 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 claim that you can make there is which which some people do that it looks like these revelations at least these parts of them originated somewhere else and in a, in a completely different environment and so on. So if, the, yeah, if, the, if you're right, Tony, if, if that's the direction they're going, then yeah, but even there, it's not something, it's not something I've, I've gone into detail on. So yeah, I would yeah. say go, go to some people who, who focus yeah. on this stuff. Yeah. There are, there are many, there are many scholars who would argue that, that the, the original Mecca was Petra in, uh, in Jordan, because it seems to match the description that is mentioned in the Quran and also there seems to be evidence that um, there was a, a place of worship in in Petra, and also uh, Jay Smith has done a lot of work in this area. But there's a a Canadian scholar up here, David. I, I mean, I'm ashamed. I'm a Canadian. I can't I can't even remember his name now. But uh, he's a fellow that's been doing many years of research on this, where he was looking at some of the oldest uh, mosques, masjids uh, in the Islamic world, and he noted that their qiblas were all pointing towards Petra. Uh, in Jordan and not to Mecca in, in Saudi Arabia. So, yeah, I think the question is, uh, I think the question there is more to do with the geography of Mecca and and where the, the, the original city of Mecca really is. Is it really the one in Saudi Arabia or is it in, in Jordan? Personally, from the research I've done, I think I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that it's most likely the one in Petra in Jordan and that the whole story of Mecca being in Saudi Arabia, in my opinion, I think has been, uh, has been recast. It's been revised. Yeah. And you have the, like Jay Smith and Robert Spencer, who like are skeptical, even about whether Muhammad existed, yeah. at least, at least in any recognizable form. Um, I don't go that, that far. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I, I believe in the, the general Muslim timeline, but because of some of these problems, to, to me, it's it, it's it actually fits with what the Quran says that Muhammad is actually getting these revelations from what other people are saying to him, and so I think he's just jumbling together a bunch of a bunch of stuff, and it yeah. doesn't it doesn't work. Yeah, and and you know, in Surah seventeen, David, there's the the whole night journey where Muhammad is said to go to the the farthest mosque from from this mosque to the to the Al Aqsa, the the farthest mosque. And they claim it's it's in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, but in in the days in Muhammad's day there was no mosque on the Temple Mount, mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of it seems to obviously, I mean, and even the story itself, as you know, David, the night journey. There's different versions of it. So one says that Muhammad was lying in bed next to Aisha, and she noticed he was he breathing heavy, and that 
uh, his spirit left his body. And so it was more of a visionary experience. So um, th there's no doubt in my mind, I, I think that there's been some editorial work uh, that has been been done, particularly with Surah 17. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll make this our last question. Um, David, are you making any extra uh, YouTube channels? I know you have three currently, but are there, are there any uh, extra, possibly a channel shared with apostate prophet? Um, I don't know about sharing it. I mean, as far as YouTube, uh, the idea is, is that if my content is divided up, uh, among three channels, then the banning doesn't stop everything. Uh, you know, it doesn't grind everything to a halt, but, uh, what, once these, once these three channels are up and running to where I'm posting consistently, which given some other things that are going on in life right now is, uh, difficult, but it, it'll, it'll happen. This, 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 so, you know, this always happened. This, this is, this is a regular incur occurrence, uh, that a bunch of stuff, um, happens that sort of derails making videos consistently, um, periodically. Um, but once these are running smoothly, no, I'm going to be focusing more on expanding to everywhere. Uh, in, in other, in other, in other words, um, I've hired people, I've hired people to, all right, when I post this on YouTube, you chop it up, put it on Facebook, put this over here on TikTok, put this over here on Instagram and so on. And it's going out for there. And then when it gets banned over there, no problem delete it, start over, uh, here. So yeah, it's, I'm, I'm good with three right now and then sort of expanding onto everywhere else. And then that should be good for a while. Although, I mean, I'll be working with AP, um, definitely in the future. It's one of my good friends. Okay. Uh, Dave, uh, we got about three minutes or so or four minutes. So let me quickly get more in here. A couple of more questions just came in. Edward II, can a Christian who does not know the Quran or Islam and death be effective in sharing the gospel with a Muslim? Uh, yes, and Edward II, I would encourage you to read um, uh, Tactics, the book Tactics by Greg Kokel. Um, that, is, that is great for being able to have discussions with people and you don't have a ton of uh, a ton of knowledge on the topic because it focuses on asking the other person questions and what you know what the meaning of the claims is and what uh, uh, what basis the person has for believing those kinds of things and it allows you to sit back and say hey I don't know a lot about the notice there's no shame in that right I mean if a Muslim came up to you and said hey I don't really know anything about Christianity um, could you have a discussion? You clarify some things for me or something like that. You wouldn't look at that and say, ha ha, you idiot. You don't know about Christianity. You think it's cool that this person is actually having a discussion and asking some questions. And so, um, so it, it, it's the same situation. Whereas uh, if you're talking to a Muslim and you're not, you know, you're not being a, a jerk about it and you're asking questions, then, you know, lots of Muslims are going to, are going to be totally happy with that. And if you're asking them, and, and so uh, I read tactics after I sort of I sort of already had my own way of interacting with Muslims, but it was very similar. And I, I would tell people to um, I tell people to to start off with what I call what questions, like what do you believe about God? What do you believe about the Quran? What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about Muhammad? And so on. And I don't I don't at that at that point if it's an if it's an an initial conversation with someone that I'm going to be saying, seeing again, um, I'm not going to be offering criticisms unless the person invites them. I'm just going to be asking them what the belief, what they believe, mm -hmm. because that's going to give me information about what the person believes. And then I'll, and I'll, you know, find out where this person's at on a variety of issues. But at some point I'll transition to why questions. So why do you believe that about the Quran? Why do you believe that about Jesus? Why do you believe that about Muhammad? And then you start getting the person's, reasons for believing certain things. So notice at that point, like suppose you're talking to a Muslim, you ask what I, what he believes about this, what he believes about that. And then you say, why do you believe that? And he says, ah, because the Quran's been perfectly preserved. Now notice, once that person gives you his specific main reasons for believing something, now you don't have to be an expert in all of Islam. You have to go do a little research on that particular claim. And notice if you've, if you've 
had a, a nice conversation, that person says, ah, because, you know, the Quran has to be true because it's perfectly preserved, perfectly acceptable, no shame whatsoever in saying, you know, I've never studied that before. Would you mind if I went and looked into this and then came back to you if I had any further questions? Your average Muslim thinks that you're going to go and find that the Quran has been perfectly preserved if you go research it, right? But that's not what you're going to find. That's not what anyone's going to find if they actually research it. So you would then go research that person's particular reasons for believing in Islam. You are going to spot some problems because all the reasons for believing in Islam are really, really bad. You're going to find some problems. Then you go back. And even then I would start asking questions like, I would keep asking questions like, hey, you, you said, you know, perfect preservation right down to the letter. You know, I, I was, uh, so I, I was looking this up and uh, what do you do with this? Pat? I was wondering how you interpret this passage right here, which talks about, you know, Aisha's sheep eating these verses or something. Like it could be, could be all kinds of things. Um, and guess what? That Muslim who just told you perfect preservation, he's never heard that before. You're giving him very, you're giving him completely new information. He's never heard that before. But notice you're not attacking with it. You're asking for his perspective on it. What do you think about this? And I wouldn't even put, I wouldn't even put pressure on him. I'd say, hey, you know, if you want to go look this up, do a little research, uh, talk to your imam, talk to a sheikh or whatever, and get back to me, that's that's great. But what what you'll end up doing is you're you're basically doing his research for him. He believes all these claims that he should have researched at some point and never has. He just accepted them. So you're going out doing some of the research for him, bringing it to him because he's not going to hear this from his leaders. He's not going to hear this from his sheikhs. He's not going to hear this from his imams. He's not going to hear this from his family. He's got to hear it from you. And so you, you basically keep the discussion going. And then he goes out and tries to you know, start learning, figuring out responses. But the information keeps getting in, in his head. And what you're looking for eventually is this light switch moment where, wait a minute, everything my leaders have told me that keeps that was supposed to keep me confident about Islam, now that I'm looking into it, because this guy, uh, I'm finding out it's all complete nonsense. And the light switch moment is, wait a minute, if they've been lying to me about all of this, what else are they lying to me about? I can no longer have confidence in what they told me. Therefore, I need to study all this for myself. And once a person reaches that point, hey, I can't just mindlessly trust what I heard from Zakir and Ike, I need to research for myself. That person is on his way out of Islam. Yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, David. That has also been my experience. And we learned it from the best, right, David? I mean, if you look at Jesus in the, in the Gospels, uh, what was his methodology of engaging people? If you notice, he questioned people. He asked people questions and he made them think. And then he one question would lead to another. Uh, and so we are following the way of the master. That is how he taught us that we engage people with logic and with truth. And we engage them by making them think, not just by making these broad statements like the Quran is the most preserved book in the world, et cetera, et cetera. So I totally agree with you. And, and David, this is the very last question. Oh, wait, uh, wait. I, I wanted to respond to one quick comment. Okay. Which one? Uh, Ibrahim Rahman. Ibrahim he says, Rahman. Yeah. He says, says the man that tried eating the Quran. <laughs> so it looks like what he's saying is, oh, you say you're going to ask questions and so on, but you, first of all, I didn't try eating the Quran. I did eat the Quran. I <laughs> ate the Quran. I ate a surah of the Quran in Arabic, right? Um, but I also tell people, I also tell people, hey, if I'm interacting with a Muslim and we're having a conversation that I, I'm not going to eat the Quran, I'm not going to pull out a Quran. And, Aha, I'll show you. <laughs> Ibrahim, why did I eat the Quran? Follow the discussion from earlier. What did you have here? You had Muhammad Hijab threatening to rape and torture the wives of critics of Islam and encouraging his followers to do the same. Encouraging his followers to go out threatening our wives with rape and torture. I fortunately knew that Surah 6 verse 108 of the Quran tells Muslims that if something is going to lead back to massive humiliation for Islam through insults and so on, stop what you're doing. Stop doing it. Don't, don't, don't insult other people's beliefs and so on if it's going to lead them to insult Islam. So I've had that one in my back pocket for years for just such an occasion. If you cross a line where I'm saying, I am not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let that happen. 
And I know, hey, you're about to start a campaign among your hundreds of thousands of followers to threaten women with rape and torture. And I can stop you right now by taking a bite of your Quran and saying, I will encourage everyone to do this in response. Guess what? That stuff, that stopped immediately. The whole community, which, which went into an uproar, ha ha, we're all gonna, we're gonna go after your wives. It all stopped like that. Why? Because I know how to deal with these guys. So, and, and by the way, it was funny because Muslims keep bringing this up. Um, I don't know what your position is, Tony, but I've had this discussion with a ton of Christians because they would hear, ah, you ate the Quran. What in the world is that, David? How could, how could you do that? And I would, I would explain the situation. I say, and they go, oh, okay. Yeah, I get that over and over again, talking Christian pastors, um, Christian pastors, uh, Christian professors. Ah, how could you do that? And as soon as I explain it to them, it's like, oh yeah, if it's, if you're protecting people's wives and so on, from these guys launching a social media campaign to rape and torture threats, then yeah, you gotta, you gotta do that. The only exception I, so far has been uh, that I recall is James White, right? But, I mean, other than that, yeah. so far. Yeah. And so it's just a funny situation where notice what's notice what started all that. One of your narcissistic apologists, dude, um, mm. le they're, they're one of your narcissistic apologists wants attention. He's not getting enough attention, thumping his chest, thinking, aha, I'll go after their wives. Ha <laughs> ha. And then what happens? Look what it leads to. And so, uh, Ibrahim, yes. If, if your heroes are going to target women to attack women, 100 times out of 100 times, I will stop you from doing that. And if I have to eat the Quran or do whatever, <laughs> I'll, I'll do it because no one can, we don't care about your book. We don't care about your false book that calls us the worst of creatures and orders you to violently subjugate us. We do not care. With that said, if I'm not talking to someone like that and I'm talking to an average Muslim who's just been who's just had his head filled with lies, lies all his life and been told, ah, perfect preservation. Muhammad's the greatest man ever. Ah, scientific miracles been told all that nonsense. Well, guess what? I don't, I don't have any hostility towards that person, right? It's, it's not it's not his fault. He was he was raised to believe all these things. So it'd be very, very nice to that person. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your objection, Ibrahim. Right, right. Well, David, here then is our, our final question. Uh, this is from uh, Islam Mintira Overdad, Lie or Truth. Do you know some uh, Spanish apologetic channels? I didn't, I think, I didn't find anything, I think is what they mean. Um, I'm not sure what, you know, Jorge Gil, he works with, uh, um, Frank Turk's ministry and so on. Um, yeah, I'd check that out because I, I'm, I, I have no familiarity. It's not something I, it's not something I, I study, but I, I have been saying for years to basically people who are interested in Christian apologetics and, you know, come from a, like a Hispanic background or something like that. I tell them, guys, that, that the door is wide open there. So I, I'm sure there, I'm sure there is, uh, you know, uh, apologetics content in Spanish because I know there are people who do that and, and put out books and so on. But I have to say, uh, if you are a Christian apologist who knows Spanish, that the, the door is wide open. In other words, there, there, there aren't enough, there aren't enough people doing it. So if you wanted to jump into that niche. Uh, that is that is wide open. Even, even most Christian apologists would are perfectly happy with you using their material. In other words, if you if you're a, a, a budding Christian apologist and you want to put out content, most Christian apologists would say, "Hey, take take any of my content you want, translate it, use it as your own." Right? Like like me. If if, if anything I've ever said you would like to use, you do not need to give me credit. D Wood doesn't care translate it, give it as your, as your own material. Um, and a lot of other Christian apologists are, are, mm. uh, would, would be fine with that as well. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but by the way, if anyone's in the, if anyone's in the chat who, who is familiar with where to get uh good yeah. uh, Spanish apologetics content, uh, please share that. Yeah, if you know that, uh, please do share it. Yeah. And I totally agree with you, uh, David, same here. Um, I've had a couple of friends put out stuff <clears throat> in various languages in Polish and different languages from, from my videos. So, uh, if you guys are gifted in translation and uh, you, you speak a different language, uh, by all means, please do so and use it for the glory of God and for the, the expansion of the gospel. So absolutely. Um, yeah. So um, 
don't see anything so far in the chat. Um, yeah, don't see anything there. But uh, um, yeah, sorry, we wish we could help you a little more in that area. But uh, I'm sure if you do some searching, I, I think you might be able to find uh, find something out there. Uh, okay, and, and David, I know you don't want to hear about why you quit YouTube because I'm sure you've heard that in ad infinitum ad nauseum. And I've exp I've explained it repeatedly in multiple videos and multiple live streams yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And still, <laughs> yeah, and then people yeah. still, I haven't watched any of your videos where you explain it. I haven't watched any <laughs> live streams, but I want you to repeat it all right here. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, folks, uh, I just want to thank all of you guys for giving up your uh, your Wednesday evening to be with us, um, and. Um, and I also want to thank my my dear brother David Wood, uh, I've known for many many years. Uh, love him and uh, his family as well. Love the wonderful people. And so, folks, uh, continue to pray uh, for for David and his family. Pray for his ministry uh, that uh, the Lord would continue to use him as a blessing uh, and uh, to to lead our Muslim friends to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't do this for the good of our health. We do this because we love Christ. And we love the gospel. And uh, the gospel is the only hope for sinners in this world. So uh, we just uh, thank you so much, David, for being part of uh, this evening. Uh, it's always good to be with you, brother. Always good. So thank you again, David, for giving up your time. Yep. Good to be here. So, folks, thanks again for joining us. Uh, if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to subscribe, Toronto Apologetics, like the video, share it, and um, continue to pray for us that uh, the Lord would use us to to expand and use his word to set people free around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time. God willing. Bye for now.